Hello everybody and welcome to a video looking at uh, the Missouri Compromise of 1820 and the nullification crisis that runs up until uh, 1833. And in this what we're doing is we're building a picture of the very very beginning of the um, divisions between the North and the South that are ultimately going to lead to the American Civil War. Now these two events are quite distant from that Civil War but they lay some of the early groundwork uh, that caused some of the early problems or failed to solve some of those early problems that are ultimately going to lead to the breaking up of the Union. Now the two sections of uh, America that we talk about at this period of time, the North and the South, were very different in a number of different ways. Now, almost all of those can be brought back to this central issue of slavery. Now, because of having slavery, the South uh, was um, less urban, it was far more rural um, than the North, and so it was set up in a different way. And that the, the, the difference between rural life and uh, urban life explained some of the cultural differences that started to emerge. It also it brought some differences because it was the northern towns and cities that had work, and therefore that was where uh, the new immigrant groups tended to go. Also, the South wasn't in such uh, didn't have such demand for labour because it had slavery. So we can see how that all links back. Um, Slavery as a means of production also meant that the, the South needed huge amounts of agricultural land for, um, for growing cotton in particular, but also uh, crops like uh, tobacco and sugar, uh, indigo, various other different things. So these huge plantations again led to a more agricultural um, society, more agricultural uh, economy, whilst in the North, whilst having huge amounts of agriculture but to grow food, it was in the northern cities that industry developed and that was a kind of a key changing point. So whilst the north saw the uh, south as being backwards, the south looked at all the negatives of industrialization uh, and the conditions in the cities and the way of life. And they would look down their noses at that and say, look, that's just not for us. You can call it modern and progress if you like, but it looks terrible to us. We'd rather have uh, our particular way of living. And again, the background of the two economies um, with one being in the north on free labour and then the stuff in the south being on slave labour led to those differences in development of the economy. Now those differences in the economy led to different attitudes towards tariffs. So tariffs are taxes imposed on imports and exports. Now the north and its young industry wanted protection against uh, the competition from British and European industry, particularly British industry, because the, the American industry was young, it was just developing, and didn't have the capacity, didn't have the strength to compete with the cheaper British imports, and therefore the tariffs would protect American industry and let it develop. The South exported goods, in particular cotton, to Britain. And they didn't want tariffs going up in between America and Britain. They wanted to be able to trade freely. So the British would be more willing to buy their, their cotton and other luxury uh, produce. And they could then buy things from the British uh, nice and cheaply. They didn't want to pay inflated prices because it suited the North. So we've got these fundamental differences and they're gonna feed into the bits we look at today. So the Missouri Compromise, well, well why, why was this needed? Back in, in 1803, there was something known as the Louisiana Purchase, where the Americans bought a huge amount of land um, from France, cost them $15 million. Uh, and there was part of this land, known as, which became Missouri, that wanted to become a state, so stop being part of a territory and, and form into a state. And it wanted to enter the Union as a slave state. There was a problem with this at the time because there were 11 slave states and 11 free states. If Missouri um, joined, um, there would be um, 12 uh, states on one side and 11 on the other. There's two senators um, in per state, so that would give them advantage of two in the Senate. Uh, and whilst the South thought this was a wonderful idea, uh, particularly because the North outnumbered them in um, the House, the House of Representatives, because the, the population determined the number of uh, members of the House of Representatives the state had, and the North was more populous, and, and increasingly so. 
the South saw just being fair, really, that they had the balance of power in the Senate and the North had the balance of power uh, in the House. Um, also, the view in the South was that that slavery was acceptable, that it was allowed by the Constitution. Therefore, there really shouldn't be any problem with it spreading into new parts uh, of America. The North, however, generally considered uh, Missouri joining as a slave state to be a bad idea. Uh, they wanted to maintain that equality in the Senate. And although things like abolitionism are not strong at this point in time, there was a widely held view in the North that, that was uncomfortable with the idea of slavery expanding. It wasn't, again, a huge, there were not a huge number of people demanding that it was removed where it already existed, but there was an uneasiness about it being allowed to spread. Right, so what was the Missouri Compromise? Well, there was an attempt before we get onto the real thing, known uh, as, as the Talmadge Amendment. Uh, and in this, there's this opponent of slavery, Talmadge, and he goes, right, if Missouri comes in as a slave state, then I'm going to put some conditions on that are going to mean ultimately it will stop being that. First of all, to ban the introduction of any further slaves, so no further slaves could be taken into Missouri. And the second was to free the, the children of slaves once they reach the age of 25. And he said, so, so Missouri can come in as a slave state, but ultimately it won't be in the long term. So both parts of that passed through the House, but failed in the Senate. Uh, and we start to see this rising tension. And then he appears... The great compromiser, this guy Henry Clay, who we're going to see a lot of in future videos, and we'll see later on in this one as well. He comes in, and he's very good at compromise. He's really good in 1820. He's really good with uh, the notification crisis. He's really good in 1850. So he comes in and he says, right, well, that Missouri is a slave state, but at the same time, I'm going to chop this bit of Massachusetts off and call it Maine, and we'll get it, let that enter as a free state. And therefore, what you will have is you will have continued balance. And also they're going to draw this line across uh, the Louisiana Purchase, uh, the 36, uh, 30 of latitude line, and they go, right, anything above that in the future will become a um, free state, anything below it will become a slave state. Uh, this was passed, it becomes law, and it seemed to have dealt with the issue in that period of time. But it only deals with the Louisiana Purchase. So what's its impact? Well, there's the good bits and then there's the bits that make you a bit cross and, and, and aren't so good. So Missouri and Maine both join the Union. So that's that's good. We've got one of it, one one of the, on each side joining. So the political balance has stayed the same. Um, the the decisions have been made about um, slavery in the Louisiana Purchase going forward. So we're not going to have to go through all this whole uh, malarkey again. And then we see further states joining Arkansas in 36, Michigan in 37. You'll notice how close those two are together. And again, we're seeing um, the balance being maintained and everything's fine. But it's a compromise, but neither the North or the South are hugely happy. So the chances are this is going to raise its ugly head again, uh, particularly as it, it left up open the question of slavery outside Louisiana Purchase. What happens if the USA expands west, which it wants to do? What happens if it adds new territories? What's going to happen there? And so we're left with a lot unanswered. And it does leave this legacy that, that everyone's going to assume you have to have a balance between slave and free states. And whichever side is on the wrong side of that is immediately going to point back to this and go, this is an established precedent. You can't do it. So it is storing up some problems for the future. Right. Now, the next one we're going to look at is nullification. Well, what, what is nullification and why do it? So nullification is the idea that a state can just look at a particular law and go, we don't want that law. We're not going to impose it in our state. And there's a bit of a debate about whether a state actually has that right. Now, the cause of the argument over this goes back to a tariff. And earlier I mentioned the differences between the North and the South on tariffs. And so the USA is going through a, a particular economic downturn in the 1820s. Uh, South Carolina, this was southern state, deep south, southern state was particularly badly affected. And actually its population is dis decreasing at this point. Now, South Carolina is a particularly um, strongly pro-slavery state, partly because of its demographics. Over half of its population, 55 percent, are slaves in 1830. In a lot in a lot of the plantation areas in South Carolina, the uh, the white population is vastly outnumbered by the slave population. 
Uh, and this, the um, fortunes of South Carolina are very much based on slave industry. So this makes South Carolina particularly sensitive to anything that might threaten uh, the position of slavery in an institution or as an economic force. In 1828, Congress passed this new tariff. The South don't like it. They call it the tariff of abominations. It's not that they are taxing abominations. That is a nickname given to it. Um, the vice president at the time is the scary looking guy at the top of the screen, um, John Calhoun, and he enormously published uh, South Carolina ex exposition and protest. And he says, look, right, this is terrible. This, this is an absolute disgrace. And what it does is it goes against um, the rights of uh, individual states. Um, it says, look, some rights are given to federal government and the rest of the are given to the states. And in this case, if the state doesn't like it, the state can override the federal government. Now, at this point, Andrew Jackson becomes president and he defended the tariff policy. Um, Calhoun uh, resigns and goes on very quickly to become senator of South Carolina. So what happened? Well, there's a series of, of debates and arguments over this, is particularly a, a bitter debate in, in 1830 in the Senate. Um, and then followed, following this, there was um, the traditional democratic celebration honoring Jefferson, uh, Jefferson's birthday. And then there's a bit of kind of naughty toasting. Um, so Jackson says our federal union, it must be preserved, going very strongly in the idea that no, you, nobody's nullifying laws, nobody's going anywhere. Um, uh, and that uh, everything's going to stay as it is. Whilst Calhoun says the union next to our liberty, the most dear, suggesting the federal government is stepping on the uh, liberty of the South Carolinians. And his fellow South Carolina Senator uh, Robert Haynes said the union of the states and the sovereignty of the states. So they're digging at each other. They're make, they're, it's becoming quite clear. The South Carolina is really unhappy about these tariffs and is willing to do something about it. Tariff signs, a second tariff is signed in, in 32. It reduced the tariff rate, so you would have thought you'd get rid of the crisis, but it doesn't. Um, South Carolina says, look, this is um, unconstitutional, this law, and we will not impose it. We will not have these tariffs in, in South Carolina. South Carolina. And they said, we will secede if you make us do it. Jackson was not going to be pushed round, and he said, right, if they don't do it, I need the power to force them to do it. And so he passes the force bill uh, saying we can impose this on South Carolina. It's looking like we're going to be in a really difficult situation. Now, South Carolina is hoping that the rest of the South will rally around them, but they don't. Henry Clay, um, a fellow southerner of Calhoun, um, manages to work out a compromise, creates a third tariff, tariff known as the compromise tariff. Uh, and what that does is it, it lowers the rates yet further. And South Carolina kind of backs down. It, it it's, accepts that bill, but it does use still use nullification. It nullifies the force bill. But obviously now it's accepted the tariff. That's a bit kind of a side issue because Jackson doesn't use doesn't need to use the force bill because South Carolina has agreed to a tariff. So it's all a bit of posturing. South Carolina is stood alone and we're, we're going to keep coming across South Carolina as the most radical of the slave states and often one that causes problems. Calhoun himself will continue to cause problems. Right. So what's the impact of nullification? Well, a lot of it is bad. Um, South Carolina was prepared to secede from the Union. And we will see them do this many years later in 1860. But we start to seeing the seeds now that are going to lead to the Civil War. And what we're really seeing now is this this tension between federal government and states' rights. So stability in America would rely on federal government not trampling on those states' rights. Now, the states' right that the South is going to be most keen on, going back to the early part of the video, is all going to be stuff surrounding slavery. So. Anything that involves slavery is going to be turned into by the South, a state's rights issue. And this is really going to store, store up some problems. Now, we can see that nullification is not an option. It doesn't work. And so in some ways that, that you could say, well, that sounds quite good. But what it's going to mean is that when we get to the point in 1860, 1861 of a massive crisis, then nullification doesn't work. So what you're going to see instead is proper secession.
Now, we do see some positives. Jackson, who had always been an advocate of states' rights, goes really quite a long way to protect the union. So maybe this is showing us the strength of pro-union feeling and the idea of keeping the states together. Uh, nullification is seen as not as a completely asectional issue because it's South Carolina versus the rest rather than the North versus the South. So South Carolina can be seen as more of a sole agent on this. So maybe we exaggerate it in, in terms of seeing it in terms of North versus South. Right now, the other bit on this is a constitutional issue. Unless you, the American Constitution says the federal government has a law, it has the right over a particular area of law, then this seems to really suggest that it sits with the states. Uh, and so slavery should really cease to be a divisive issue, because if each state can decide on slavery in turn, in turn, inside its own borders, then those who want it can have it and those who don't want it won't have it. And therefore you would think, well, maybe this isn't going to become such a big issue. But linking back to the stuff we've seen earlier in the video with um, the idea of expansion is that's all well and good if the number of states stay exactly the same. The North and the South are going to argue once new states are added. And that's when uh, stuff we look at in future videos uh, or different videos, things like um, the Mexican War, are going to really uh, stir up lots of problems. Because we look at that and when once new states have been added, well, what happens then? When new territories are becoming new states, what happens then? And they're going to be the big issues in the, in the 1840s and 1850s that are really going to stir up sectional tension and take us closer and closer to war. Right. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, please remember to like, to share, to subscribe. Uh, I hope you have um, found this uh, as interesting as my cat Tom, as you can see at the top. Who obviously, as this is um, fo footage of him listening very, very intently and really enjoying all of this information. Right. Thank you again for watching, and I'll speak to you all again soon.